So hello and welcome uh, to this uh, uh, session on on uh, on uh, Intel Ceph Enterprise or other Ceph product update. Um, my name is Shyam Shah. I am um, the product management lead for Red Hat Storage Server. I'm kind of doing this on behalf of the Intel team today. Some of you might have joined uh, the the session, the sales enablement session that we did today morning. You know, um, Singapore time. It was you know, 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. to 10 a.m. So, so this material that I'm going to use uh, is going to be very similar to what was used in that session. However, what what I plan to do in this session is um, is actually draw some comparison and contrast with Red Hat Storage Server as I go along, because uh, you have already a lot of you have already heard the the basic sales uh, pitch or uh, you know that and the architecture pitch that was done yesterday and today. So so I, I basically thought what would be new, uh, and the new would be probably try to do a compare and contrast with Blaster as I go along. So so the slides are similar, but I'll do a verbal um, you know, comparison and contrast. So I will skip over some of the slides as I go along because um, a lot of it uh, is, um, you know, it will be repetitive if you have already seen it and you have been seeing a lot of it. <laughs> Some of you have been seeing it a lot of it over the last two days, but uh, just try to make sure that I don't, you know, say, you know, try to give it a different touch. Okay, so um, the agenda is again, you know, it will, we'll start with an introduction to Ceph, then we'll look into the downstream product that is actually sellable today. Um, and what what are the features? What are the use cases? Customer profiles, pricing, and case studies. And what's the roadmap? You know that's that's how uh, we divide up the session. And as I go along in each of these things, I'll try to compare and com contrast with Red Hat Storage Server. So the vision here um, uh, from the Ink Tank team or the X Ink Tank team is uh, is very similar to what we have said with Red Hat Storage, which is. Uh, we have looked at how the web scale 2.0 companies, you know, like the Google, the Yahoo's, or the Facebooks of the world do storage, and and they they do not do it the traditional way. They're not buying storage from traditional hardware vendors and trying to do storage with that. They they actually do their own own storage with on commodity hardware and and software they write, which does replication, which does you know bit rot, which does a lot of the things that commercial storage providers do, but but they they do all of that themselves. However, they don't necessarily market that stuff, which is where we come in. You know, Red Hat, uh, you know, basically thrives on, on open source technologies and making them, you know, stabilized for commercial usage. So, so, so you know, customer like Citibank or Bank of America or, you know, a DreamWorks can come to us and ask for, you know, help and we can help them. This is where we step in. Uh, the Web 2.0 companies do not actually market these things unless they're doing their own public cloud. So, so the vision is very similar. You know, uh, and both Blaster and and Ceph were had similar roots. Um, you know, they were they're basically built with uh, to disrupt the existing storage technologies that exist today. Uh, it's just how you know uh, Linux disrupted Unix. So. So very similar visions uh, on how they're born. So, so this is a brief history. The next slide is a brief history on, on how we got here. Ceph actually is about 10 years old. The first Git commit of Ceph have been, happened in you know, June of 2004. So, so we are actually celebrating 10 years of Ceph as we speak, So which, which speaks loads about um, you know, a project that has been um, around for for a decade and and the rule of thumb in general is you know file systems takes a dec a decade to mature before they're ready for production use and and in this case we actually hit a decade so um you might have heard that before that you know the people don't want to use storage technology that's two years old because it's just not battle tested ready for production uh Ceph, as you can see has had a long history um, the production or the commercialization of Ceph is is new. Um, the first production version of Ceph came out in October of uh, 2013. However, uh, the technology has been open source 
has been around for a while. You know, client-side enablement has happened in the Linux kernel and is available in the mainline Linux kernel that Linux store was maintained. So maintained. So it's it's been around. It's it's not a brand new technology that we just acquired and we are we're trying to sell. Just just to give you a perspective uh, of where we are. So so contrast that to Gluster. It's it's also about eight years old. Gluster started in about 2006. So again, in a similar sort of timelines we're looking at, and and it does take storage technologies this long to mature. So it's not surprising that uh, you know um, this is it's now that we are about to productize and we are about to actually go to the market with these things. So the this section of the presentation basically talks about the open the the open source the upstream Ceph project uh, before we dive into the downstream product. Um, Ceph is uh, marketed as a unified storage solution. And when we use the word unified, it basically means common storage that which can serve out, you know, which can be used for object storage, block storage, and file storage. It does not mean multi-protocols access or cross-protocol access that, that we commonly use in context of Red Hat storage server, where you can, you know, insert um, data using one protocol, whether it's file or object, and you know, extract data using another. It's not, that's not how unified is used, just so that you know, it's it's more like a common storage platform that provides you um, different kinds of access, you know, um, and, and and it's not meant to be cross protocol. So, so you cannot actually put something using an object API and get it using a file API. So that's that's not there. So, so roughly equivalent object storage is to Amazon S3, um, block storage to Amazon EBS and file system. Closest comparison is actually Gluster, but um, you know it's it's um, the file system part, which is still um, kind of um, not as mature as the rest of the other uh, as the other two parts. Can also compare with uh, commercial offerings from Isilon or Luster, which is an HPC file system that's been around for a while. So, so that's the broad uh, Ceph unified storage story. Uh, the architectural components of uh, Ceph. Uh, uh, the kingpin here is this radar layer down on the bottom, the red, um, the red rectangle. Uh, it has a fancy acronym, you know, Reliable Autonomous Distributed Object Store. Um, it has all the smarts um, that actually form. For, it's a foundational layer that that provides the storage capacity, uh, and it is fundamentally an object storage layer. So Ceph is basically, you know, what industry experts will or analysts will call an OBS or an object based storage and and then it, it provides block capabilities uh, and object capabilities and file system capabilities but but fundamentally it's it's an object store this is unlike cluster or red hat storage which is fundamentally a file store and and you you you, you get to access and and everything else supported is is in is actually a file in the end. So so when Red Hat Storage exports an object API, it's just an you know, object API on top of a file store. So that's kind of uh, in the fundamental conceptual difference between the two technologies. One is an object store, the other is a file store. So the next slide is uh, just showing that uh, Ceph has a strong community. They've done you know uh, the Ceph team has overall done a very good job of uh, maintaining a very healthy community you know you can see the stats here in terms of you know how many developers participants and, and all that and 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 there is active uh, active contribution going on from um from 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 engineers who who do not necessarily work for red hat or ink tank so which is always a, a very good thing because you can leverage the community, you know, and some of the uh, features that are uh, that are that are coming in in upcoming releases of Ceph are actually initiated by developers who did not work for Ink Tank, which is uh, a really nice thing to be able to do that. So, so it's a it's a live, active, growing community. Uh, the next slide. Uh, is uh, basically OpenStack user survey from uh, May, uh, so it's very recent, which basically positions Ceph as the leader 
for OpenStack storage layer. You know, you can look at LVM and NFS and things like that, but that's really just local storage that people are using in, you know, uh, sort of dev, uh, you know, dev and test or proof of concept thing. But when it comes to, you know, real production usage, um, you know, Ceph leads the pack, and uh, and I, I know LVM shows up, but it's only a matter of time that people will start considering um, a serious enterprise grade offering for OpenStack and not just keep on using LVM and NFS. So, so that that is the. Uh, number one Ceph use case too, uh, in, in terms of being the best storage layer, uh, the mm -hmm. best storage substrate for OpenStack, and it shows in the survey, and how many people are adopting it. Mm -hmm. uh, so the product, let's some, spend some time on, on what actually the product offers, which is different, a little bit different from what the Ceph project offers upstream. Um, so, so the biggest thing in the product is uh, what's prioritized in, in, you know, in ICE, which is, uh, stands for Ink Tank Ceph Enterprise, um, is the name of the commercial distro of Ceph, um, is, is block and object. So block and object are the only two parts that are actually actively supported and fully supported by the distro. The file system is, isn't um, because it's not uh, ready for prime time. So it starts with the best from Ceph. Um, it is um, with with object and block. On top of it, you know, um, after you get the base layer for object and stuff, we we add Calamari, which is an on-premise web-based application for managing uh, Ceph. So that you just you know, there's more to it than command line. So you you can you can manage it from uh, UI, a web-based UI. Uh, it provides deployment tools. Um, for easier installation of Ceph. Now, um, just so that you guys know, uh, unlike Red Hat Storage Server, which is shipped as an ISO, which includes pretty much all the entitlements you need for setting up Red Hat Storage, uh, Ceph or ICE currently shifts, um, ships as a tarball with installer files that installs the RPMs um, in the locations that, that we need them to be in. So it's slightly different. Um, imagine this, um, my analogy, uh, the closest analogy uh, of this is like, uh, this is like an ISV product on top of, on top of an OS. It's not a fully integrated, it doesn't ship with an OS or anything like that. It's, it's, uh, it's like, just like you source binaries from an ISV, you will source binaries from, um, you know, you get, uh, you know, ICE binaries and, and that's what is currently covered by the subscription. And the support services, you know, that's that's you know, I don't spend too much time on it. You guys know what it is, you know, right? It's it's Red Hat's bread and butter uh, business model. Uh, we just inherit that from uh, from Intank and and how they define it. So, so it's it's nothing new there. Um, so basically, that's that's kind of what ICE is composed of. You know, it has the base uh, object and block support uh, from from Ceph. And and Calamari as the management tool uh, and deployment tools and the and the ink tank uh, um, subscription services. Uh, it's priced based on capacity right now, um, uh, which may or may not uh, stay the same going forward. But uh, we are working on that on figuring out what's the best way uh, to price Ceph. Uh, right now, basically, it's the pricing structure is the same that was used by ink tank pre acquisition. Um, it's subscription based and, and it's a single price for all protocols. So, you know, just like any other Red Hat product uh, or most other Red Hat products, we know we, there, there is no charge for, for additional features, etc. It's, it's uh, you know, it's all in one subscription. Uh, this page uh, basically shows some calamari um, you know, screenshots. Um, it's, uh, it's a pretty cool with, you know, uh, uh, web browser or web-based tool to look at, you know, it gives you a, a, a quick snapshot of what's going on in the cluster, you know, with, with all the components that make up a Ceph cluster. And you don't really have to dig through, you know, multiple menus to figure out what's going on. So Calamari is the equivalent of what Red Hat Storage Console offers. You know, they kind of slightly different. Calamari is right now is more like a overview of what's going on. And I think you, you can get a little bit of um, 
little bit of management with it too. Uh, Red Hat Storage Console is more of uh, you know a UI for command and control, and and monitoring is is going to be provided by Nagios uh, in the upcoming release of Red Hat Storage Server. So that's kind of where they are today. Um, and you may ask, you know, are we going to have two different UIs going forward for the two different products? The answer to that is we don't know yet. Uh, we are actively discussing what a common management plane will look like going forward for the two technologies. And we'll have to kind of reconcile the two. Um, it's obvious. However, you know, in the short term and even in the medium term, um, these will stay. You know, Red Hat Storage Console for Red Hat Storage Server and Calamari for for ICE uh, will will continue to be shipped, and probably even features added as and as and when needed. So this is the support matrix for for uh, ICE. Now again, it's a little bit different from Red Hat Storage Server. Red Hat Storage Server, you know, supports pretty much only RHEL as the host OS. So you cannot get Red Hat Storage Server or GlusterFS on any other OS today because it's not packaged as an ISV product. It's packaged as uh, you know an all-in-one ISO that you take and you know install and it converts your server to a to a storage server. Um, this one, ICE on the other hand is uh, you know a tarball of RPMs that you can install on multiple operating systems or host operating systems is a term that the uh, Ink Tank folks use. Um, so. So today it's it's supported um, you know on both um, you know uh, rel um, uh, six point five and seven and 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 the debian based uh, distros for which are ubuntu twelve and fourteen um, and uh, on the client side which is uh, on the blue you know it's um, it can be accessed accessed from rel osp four and five um, and rel six five can run the the gateway, um, the storage, sorry, the object gateway. Um, we're doing a lot of work to make sure that, uh, you know, Ceph is accessible from RHEL 6.5 and RHEL 7.0 as well, but it's work in progress. So, so we are kind of um, making sure that we can get all the enablement pieces in. And it's also compatible uh, with Ubuntu um, uh, and other, other Linux distros that support the RBD uh, kernel mods, uh, kernel module. So, so that's kind of the the support matrix matrix today. Um, and uh, again, um, this is for now ICE 1.2 release, and that's how we're going to release it. Um, ICE has a life cycle of about 18 months, so this should stay true until end of 2015, uh, provided you know ICE 1.2 uh, releases by June. So it's an 18 months life cycle. So, so that's that's kind of where we're looking at. Um, again, uh, the support matrix. Uh, we don't. Again, we we're not saying that it will stay exactly the same going forward, but we are working on you know what, based on the customers that we have inherited from Ink Tank and others, and what kind of demands they have on the appropriate support matrix packaging and pricing, uh, and and those changes will will slowly make it into the product in the next upcoming months. It's it's not going to happen uh, next week for ICE 1.2 release. So for ICE 1.2, this this will, you know, this is the this is the support matrix. So let's go to the feature overview. Um, ICE 1.2, the big new feature in ICE 1.2 is uh, um, erasure coding and cache tiering. Um, both uh, are prominently featured and are a part of uh, Ceph's Firefly release, as they call it. Uh, Firefly, Firefly was released in May 2014, so just uh, a month back. And ICE 1.2 will be based out of it. So uh, let's go and look into uh, erasure coding in detail. Um, I think uh, most of you here probably know what it means. Uh, it's just um, instead of maintaining, maintaining multiple copies of an object, you basically do, uh, erasure coding is basically a raid over the network, you know, uh, analogous to a raid over the network. So, so that you don't have to do whole copies of an object or a file, you know, for that matter. Um, and you can, you can basically retrieve a copy of a file or an object from 
um, you know, depending upon how how you raise your code, it so so you have n slash n comma k pieces. So for example, if you go with five comma two, you can you can go and assemble the pieces uh, of an object from uh, even if two two of the nodes are down, provided the object is spread amongst five. So it's a parity. You know, it's it's a it's basically raid over the network. That's that's what it is. So um, uh, erasure coding is being, you know, introduced for the first time uh, in Ceph um, or in Ice Wonder 2, and it's pretty cool. Uh, it it its biggest draw or uh, you know or benefit is that it it reduces total cost of ownership of the solution. So you don't need to replicate, you know, three x. You know, you don't re need three x resources for for protecting all your data. You can do with much less depending on the algorithm you choose. So in terms of feature overview, just like Gluster, you know, um, you can grow um, and shrink. Uh, basically, it's a pay-as-you-grow or shrink uh, architecture um, uh, and uses uh, uh, what they call the crush algorithm. And in Gluster, um, you know, it's called the EHA or extended hashing. Um, Rebalancing is actually automatic in, in Ceph, unlike in Gluster, where you actually have to um, issue the rebalance command manually. In, in Ceph, you don't have to do that. When you, when you expand a cluster and add more OSDs, OSDs are the things that hold the data in Ceph, it, it just rebalances on its own. You just don't have to do anything. In Gluster, on the other hand, you actually have to add uh, new storage to the pool and then issue a rebalance command. Of course, you can automate that using scripts and stuff, but but it's uh, it's another it's a level of automation you have to add on top of Gluster. Ceph does that on its own, and Ceph does also supports just like Gluster hot or phase software upgrades. By that you, we mean you can go from one version of Ceph to another um, in a live cluster. And you can have a portion of the Ceph cluster at one version, like V1, and another at V2, and they will interoperate without, you know, without showing any problems until you have upgraded the entire cluster to say V2. So, so this is uh, again um, uh, a pretty big deal uh, in enterprise environments uh, or cloud environments where people cannot take down their installations just for upgrading, and and this is something people. Uh, our end users um, desire a lot, so so Ceph can can do that um, 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 based on the architecture it has today. Um, APIs and extensibility it supports S3, um, which Gluster uh, doesn't support. Gluster today just supports Swift uh, when when it is used as a file store uh, with an object API. Gluster does not support S3. And um, it has full integration with OpenStack block storage. Um, there are native language bindings for an API layer called LibRados. So, so one can write, you know, actually apps in C, C++, Python, et cetera. It has a lot of uh, library bindings. And it has a complete management API to manage, um, you know, all cluster and object storage functions with a RESTful API. This, in in Red Hat storage, this would be similar to what you have uh, for RevM, the the REST API for RevM. So they have that too. Uh, security, they use access control lists for you know object storage user and bucket level permissions and 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 uh, ICE or Ceph also has um, you know quotas for both pool and object storage limits as well as user based quotas, which is going to get introduced in uh, 1.2 ICE 1.2. Uh, contrasting this with uh, Red Hat storage, Red Hat storage does support quotas at volume and at directory levels, uh, but it does not support user-based quotas today. Uh, in terms of reliability and availability, um, the feature set between Ceph and um, and Gluster are similar. Um, they were both designed from ground up to be fault tolerant. Uh, failure is normal was the rule of the day, and and automatically you know recover from uh, from failures using you know in Gluster we call it self healing, in Ceph you know it's also healing and uh, and that's that's something that these things were engineered from day one. Uh, 
Um, Ceph supports dynamic block resizing. Uh, the data placement in Ceph is just like Gluster, uh, where you don't really have to consult the metadata server to know where you should place the data. It's based on a lookup, and when you retrieve it, it's the reverse lookup. So it's it's very similar. Uh, but in Ceph, um, uh, in Gluster, um, the extended hashing, alg hashing algorithm that's used is not really policy based today so you cannot really tell the extended hashing algorithm to to place some things on a, a set of uh, bricks um, which are in a particular say rack as opposed to setting uh, putting them in another rack uh, in in ceph there's a way to do that using uh, using crush the algorithm that's used where you can actually um, tell crush uh, to prefer you know, you know, to prefer data centers or racks, etc., over others, because it's policy aware. Uh, in Gluster, there's a effort to to bring that same level of functionality. It's being worked on upstream. Upstream, there's a new translator called Policy Based Allocation in Gluster, which is kind of trying to do the same thing. Um, again, automatic failovers. Uh, yeah, that's that's kind of a given for these kind of distributed systems. It's like you know, you kind of have to recover and heal from fails um, and it's the same it's similar uh, in both the technologies performance uh, copy and write cloning uh, provision virtual machines blocks devices in uh, Ceph has in in memory client side caching massive parallelism um, i think in terms of workload profiles um, um, basically if you look at Ceph, uh, it does well with large files Small files is okay, just like Gluster. It does well with random I.O. It does okay with sequential I.O. Um, Gluster does very well with sequential I.O. It does okay with random I.O. Uh, small files also, you know, uh, uh, Gluster and Ceph, they do okay, and large files, uh, Gluster also does really well. So so that's kind of the overall performance profile, though we we, we need to do a little more work on, on benchmarking Ceph a little bit more in terms of different kinds of workloads. So that is a uh, work in progress or we'll see more more material published on this you know, in the coming months. Again, performance, you know, um, for Ceph continuing, cache tiering, um, you know, is, is basically, um, you know, you promote hard data to SSDs. You know, the whole idea of cache tiering is you can have a pool in Ceph that's a cache for another pool. And when that pool fills up and you have policies by which you can just move the data to another pool. So you can kind of do, you know, sort of tiering with Ceph now with ICE 1.2. And the backing pool uh, could be a regular pool or it could be a regular coded pool, depending upon, you know, what you want to use. Flash journals uh, enhances the right performance of data. And I think in Ceph, you can, what you can do is you can have journals that, um, are based on SSDs and you can specify them when you when you set up Ceph so that if you, you get better performance. So there's some knobs and dials there that you can you can use today. Um, Gluster on the other hand today, um, you can definitely use SSDs if you want to, but there is no separation of metadata in Gluster yet where you can put some Gluster metadata on SSDs um, so that it in um, it, it's optimized. Customize, uh, customizable stripe sizes, you know, that's, that's again, you know, um, you can just uh, um, have stripe, stripe sizes based on your workload so that, you know, uh, so that you can have the best performance. Um, Multi-site and disaster recovery, uh, Ceph has, a, today, Ceph can do geo-replication for object stores, uh, master to slave, uh, however, um, unlike Gluster, there there are no failover and failback capabilities, and none of the two, none of the technologies today uh, offer what what's known as global clusters or multi-master geo replication, where all the sites could be active uh, at one time. So that's not there in either. Um, read affinity is is similar to what Gluster offers uh, via NUFA. Where if you want, you can you can read from from the from the storage node that's closer to you, as opposed to reading it across the network from another data center. So again, similar feature set. Um, 
in my, um, in again continuing on multi-site and disaster recovery you can export snapshots to geographically di dispersed data center you can do incremental snapshots and you can do stretched radars what what i mean by stretched radars is um, is similar to what you can do with lasted today where if you have data centers that are close enough to each other or or they are linked using dark fiber and have very little latency a lan light latency for the intersite link then you can you can kind of um, you know, lay Ceph or Blaster across two data centers and consider them to be a part of one single cluster. So, so I think in 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 context of Red Hat storage, we call it the stretched cluster use case. Uh, in in context of Ceph, it's stretched radars. Cost effectiveness, uh, you know, thin provisioning uh, is supported. Uh, allow so you can allow over provisioning. Ceph runs on community hardware, just like Gluster. Um, it runs on heterogeneous hardware, just like Gluster. So you don't have to match all the servers that, you know, that make up the storage pool. And erasure coding obviously is a big TCO boost. Uh, that's uh, that's in the upcoming release. Web scale applications. This is something that uh, is pretty unique um, um, uh, for Ceph. It's actually. Um, um, Ceph has this library called Librados uh, on which um, um, uh, users can write their apps uh, and access Ceph's Redos cluster directly. This is similar to what you can do with Gluster with libgf API, where you can uh, you can basically bypass the fuse layer and interact with the Gluster bricks, bricks directly without going through the kernel. So so there are. You know, big. Um, you know, Ceph has a few deployments where customers are are using uh, the library, um, you know, directly instead of going through a standard API like S3 or something or S3 or Swift to get the best performance and and um, and to make use of uh, a lot of uh, powerful features that are in in the Redos gateway. Uh, so this is the high performance native protocol. So. Web-based management again. It's uh, through Calamari dashboard. Uh, you can look at it's. It's basically you know it gives you a good snapshot or overview of what's going on in the cluster at some, one point of time. Uh, this is diagnostics, workbench management. You know, um, it's just a, a good overall snapshot. Can do a little bit of trending too. Um, however, it will. It's still kind of uh, undergoing you know a lot of work. So you'll see more more features being supported as time goes by. So let's look at quickly look at the Ceph use cases. Um, uh, and this is uh, an important slide. This is where we are kind of trying to make sure that sales people understand, sales teams understand where to sell Ceph and where to sell Red Hat storage. So the overall uh, theme here is uh, for any OpenStack deals, you know, um, and primarily today they're block and object, you know, um, the file services in 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 OpenStack, which is Manila, is still not really ready for anything. It's not real. You know, sell Ceph. You know, lead with Ceph um, for all OpenStack deals, and for all object storage deals also. You know, lead with Ceph. And there are sub use cases that we'll discuss on what they mean, but at least lead with Ceph, except when except for when uh, a customer asks for a file based interface for that object store which happens once in a while customers will say yeah my primary use case is is, is an object store but we would like to access the objects using files too and that's when we probably need to get engaged and see if if red Hat storage would be a better fit but otherwise lead with Ceph for all kinds of file use cases anything that has to do with nfs smb Small file, large file, you know, um, you know, streaming, rich media streaming use cases, or uh, just lead with uh, Red Hat storage for now. You know, that's that's kind of the big stuff. Uh, uh, file, the file um, component of Ceph is is work under progress, and uh, there are specific use cases for Red Hat storage where it's being tuned, you know, to do specific file workloads, for example. Um, Hadoop analytics, uh, you know, or big data analytics, um, backup target for Commvault. We're working on a Splunk uh, uh, white paper, uh, so we, one can use uh, Red Hat storage for uh, for cold storage for Splunk. So, so any kind of file, um, any kind of file use cases use Red Hat storage. 
So the next slide is basically um, the number one use case for Ceph today. Uh, it is as the storage provider for OpenStack, and you know, and and it provides storage for Cinder, Swift, Glance, um, and and Nova today. And uh, again, um, uh, it's probably a big part of the reason uh, why we have um, Ceph in the portfolio today. Number one use case always lead with uh, any kind of open stack storage deals. Uh, we should be leading with Ceph. <clears throat> For cloud storage um, is is the next important use case. It's fundamentally an object store, but it could be used by service providers or uh, or hosting providers or public uh, public cloud providers to provide in a cost effective object store to their end users um, so that's that's where the, the s3 of the swift layer comes into play that rides on the object gateway on top of radars and and this is uh, this is again a very important use case that that chef has uh, and a lot of its existing customers are are on this you know they use chef in this manner uh, cloud storage with DR is simply extending the cloud storage to to a master slave architecture where you have um, you know two data centers, one as the master, one as the slave, so that you can have a copy of your data somewhere else, not in the exact data center. So again, that's that's something that people want to do, um, and it's possible as long as you know no failover or failback capabilities are are warranted. Web scale applications again. It's a variant of an object store use case. Uh, it's actually the use case where uh, web scale, uh, you know, uh, companies like Yahoo and others um, link their apps to the Libredos application, bypass all of the S3 or the Swift API layer, and goes to the Redos uh, layer directly, uh, and uses all the smarts that that are in that gateway. So that they can basically tune their apps to do whatever they want and 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 use the powerful features that are in Redos, as opposed to being bound by you know what is exposed to them via S3 or Swift. So that's that's the web scale application. Again, it's a variant of the object store use case. And the third one, you know, it's really uh, again a very variant of the object store use case, but it's called cold storage. It's it's now real with ICE 1.2. Where you know you can have um, you know two pools, you know one pool is a cache for the other, and the other pool could be you know the the backing pool could be erasure coded, you know um, based on you know or or come simply replicated based on your need. Um, cold storage or deep archival, um, you know as it's called in 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 some other use cases, is basically you know write once, read never, or write once, read sparingly use cases where you. You probably never access the object that you wrote, but you need to store them for different reasons. And with the introduction of erasure coding, you know this becomes very enticing because uh, you don't need the, the amount of disk space that you would otherwise need if you did not have erasure coding. So out of scope use cases, um, uh, anything that's highly transactional in nature um, or low latency workloads includes databases, payroll apps, you know, SAPs. Um, they're currently out of scope. Um, um, Ceph is not optimized yet uh, to handle those workloads. Uh, content distribution, um, you know, uh, what people want to do is uh, write, read and write from a single global read write namespace. Have a single namespace and access it, you know, directly uh, from different, uh, almost like PO, uh, uh, point of presences of data. That's that's out too. VMware or Windows Shop, you know, you can be a backing store. Ceph cannot be a backing store for VM images for VMware today because um, there is no standard client support. Um, uh, so there's work being done uh, to add iSCSI support to Ceph. Which should enable some of these use cases. Um, HPC again, most of these are file-based workloads, so they're not a good good um, uh, use case for Ceph. So, so don't try to sell Ceph in these areas because uh, you'll probably not be successful. Um, next uh, section on customer pers personas, like who is a good target to sell Ceph to? Sell uh, has Ceph has been um, you know. Traditionally sold to 
uh, sold to folks within a company who are not storage admins. And and this has been, uh, and this uh, this is pretty repetitive. Um, this this has been proven in, in pretty much all all deals that Ink Tank has signed so far. The doctor has been um, depart or uh, departments within the company that that are not storage departments, but rather cloud departments or cloud storage departments where people are a more you know Linux savvy. They know what they're doing with Linux and and like Linux for one reason or the other. They're not your typical storage admins who who expect a box to be delivered to them, which you plug in and then out pops a GUI. You know, you 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 basically run a GUI on a web browser and then start configuring LANs and exposing them to to your customers. So that's that's not the profile of customers that that uh, Ceph has been sold to. Um, so in general, that's something to keep in mind. So you might not want to lead with Ceph. Uh, in an organization or in in a team that's primarily the storage admins uh, running traditional storage solutions day in and day out, because they will have a different set of requirements, which uh, may or may not be something that Ceph will fulfill, uh, you know, today. So that's that's something to uh, to lead with, you know, uh, make sure that the team that you're talking to is sort of Linux savvy. They know what they're doing with Linux, and preferably, you know. The workload is OpenStack or something like that, so that you know people have un already heard about Ceph. They know what what it is capable of and what its true potential is. So, so that's that's kind of where uh, we are. Um, again, the next slide is you know we already talked about it. Um, let's not position this to traditional storage admins yet. So, next section is on case studies. Um, OpenStack. Um, you know, um, so broadly, there are two sets of use cases for Ceph. One is OpenStack, one is Object. And the OpenStack use cases are are here. Uh, you know, uh, Cisco, Bloomberg, University of Alabama, and Deutsche Telekom. Cisco and Bloomberg have have adopted, I think, Ceph in a big way. Um, uh, Cisco has been trying to replace its uh, its existing uh, virtualization deployments using using OpenStack and Ceph as much as it is. Possible for them. Uh, Bloomberg also has has adopted Ceph in a big way, so they are they're really big uh, 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 advocates and adopters of Ceph. And and in in the cloud storage arena, which is mainly an uh, again a variant of the objects uh, object store use case, um, DreamHost, which was Ceph's or uh, Intank's parent company um, before it was spun out, um, they do have a project they call it Dream. Dream objects or something that that that's been running for years and and if you I think if you Google Dream objects you'll find lots of references on how it's being used, how it has been deployed, what issues they had and how they overcame that. So so that's that's a very widely discussed Ceph use case. You know it's it's available all over the internet. And uh, there's another one that's uh, being worked on, which is with Yahoo for Flickr. Flickr is the picture store for Yahoo, but we cannot talk too much about it uh, until it's official. So, so you know, this is still a work under progress to make sure that you know um, that we have a good use case out of this, and then you know, probably ho hopefully sell more to Yahoo. Portfolio and pricing wise, you know, Ink Tank had. Uh, to coming into Red Hat, they had two kinds of subscription. Uh, one they called the Jumpstart, which is more like a pre-production subscription, where it's think of it as you want to get your feet wet with Ceph. How do you do that without buying production subscriptions? You know, you you approach Ink Tank and they'll tell you, okay, we we have this Jumpstart or starter pack, you know, that you can take. It costs ten thousand dollars. Per cluster, it would give you, we include, you know, three days of consulting with it, uh, one supported admin, you know, unlimited email support, and it's, you know, it's a subscription for six months. And, you know, it was a good way to attract a lot of, uh, you know, initial prospects to this because a lot of people, you know, think really hard before they make uh, a decision, especially when it comes to storage. 
So this is a good way to get people, this was a good way to get people uh, introduced to the technology. Uh, also in a way so that, you know, they have the right experience. So because an ink tank person would help them bring this up and set it up the right way, as opposed to they just playing with open source bits and, and, and kind of struggling or not doing the right things. Um, so, so it was a good, good experience. Um, and then obviously there are production subscriptions which Ink Tank uh, sells, uh, which are similar to what Red Hat, Red Hat sells for subscription. So, so there's not a lot of, uh, um, you know, difference there. It's, it's, it's the same, except, except the pricing is still today, uh, you know, based on raw capacity. It's not based, based on Socketware or Instance. And we're still reviewing all of it. The acquisition is only six, six weeks old. So, so it's, it's a, a lot of it is still under review. But ICE 1 or 2 will GA with that pricing model, just so that you guys know. The roadmap, uh, you know, before going into the downstream product roadmap, again, uh, lots of disclaimers here. But in general, what, what Ceph, the project has been doing is uh, doing a release every three months. That's the cadence. And, and ICE, the product itself, uh, uh, you know, intends to do a release every six months. Uh, every alternate upstream release. So, so every other upstream release of Ceph, uh, you know, ICE will, will do an update release or something like that. So that's, that kind of has been the model. Uh, so you can see the timeline here. And going forward, um, you know, ICE, the next version of ICE or whatever it is called by then, will be 2.0 probably. And we're looking at, you know, ICE SCSI support, RBD mirroring, you know, security, LDAP, Kerberos authentication, and then uh, probably uh, one use case for the file system if it's ready. So that's that's kind of, uh, you know, where we are today. Again, you know, this roadmap is literally not something to take to the customer yet. It's highly predictive. Um, it's not committed to. So so it's, um, it, you'll get a more farmer roadmap in, in, in about two months from now. Uh, with engineering and QE commitments built in, but but this is just right now predictions, uh, nothing else. So if if that was the roadmap, you know, if if Turato comes up with those things, you know, what would be the new use cases? This is a slide basically describing that. And note that we we will spend a lot of time in in making Ceph or ICE uh, more uh, stable and performant over the next several months. So in terms of new features, you might not see a lot of brand new features, but but you will you'll see uh, a lot more on on little things that that will do. So that's that's the kind of the overview of what the roadmap will look like. So so it's not going to be drastically new features, but more on making sure that the thing is um, uh, you know ICE is really well integrated with OpenStack. It has the performance that is needed for running different kinds of OpenStack workloads. Uh, also, things that customers uh, need um, to make sure you know it's um, it works well out of the box and all of that stuff. So, so a lot of work will go into usability, manageability, performance, uh, stabilization as we go go forward. So that was uh, uh, mostly. Uh, uh, what we're doing with the roadmap. So the last section on this slide is uh, what's what we're investigating with, you know, with re regards to in integrating with other products. Uh, obviously, we'll have to put the Ceph client side enablement in well six and seven, including the kernel mods because the Ceph kernel mods are currently not enabled in in the rel kernels. So we have to do that uh, for rel seven. It's a bit easy for rel six. It's a backport, so it's a little bit more invasive than rel seven. Uh, we're also trying to put make sure that the rel osp4 and 5 releases have all of the client side packages needed for the need to run ceph out of the box so that one do not have to install these things you know after they have uh, brought up the environment so make it a little bit easier looking at integration with satellite 6 um, and then maybe later rev next year but it's still uh, you know, completely uh, under review, and it will depend on customer demand. So, with that, you know, I have uh, that's 
the, my session today. I can take up a few questions uh, uh, if uh, if you have any at this point of time. Yeah, I think. So Shivram has a question. We we require a rel subscription for the server at this point of time. Yes, you will need it because ICE wanted to on to include or bundle the rel subscriptions that are needed to run it. So yes, you will need uh, separate subscriptions for, run, for to make sure that you are covered. So let me see what else. Um, for on cloud right now, all the work we have done um, has been with Bluster. So you will see uh, the file sync and share use case with on cloud come up. You know, we we already have white papers on how that how we have integrated it, uh, and you will see a, a more advanced white white paper coming out. On that. Uh, let me see if there are more questions. Uh, okay. Okay, I think that's pretty much it. Um, I'm, I'm scanning through. Yeah, so Rev uh, questions, Shivram had a question on Rev. Yeah, so Rev, um, Ceph's not integrated or with Rev similar in the similar way that Blaster is with storage domains, you know, et cetera. You can actually make it work by putting, you know, the libraries inside of KVM, but it will be a manual thing. It doesn't really work with Rev the way it's intended to work with uh, storage domains and stuff like that. So it's not. There's some groundwork that needs to be done to make it work with RevM. Okay, that's it. I don't see any other question. Uh, okay, thanks, guys.